Hi, I'm Alyssa Cobb, and today joining me is AOPA Pilot Protection Services Plan panel attorney Robert Schulte. He is Trent Palmer's attorney. Now, Trent, many of you may uh, know of, some of you may not be familiar. He's a well-known pilot with a popular YouTube channel where he shares his fun backcountry flying experiences. Now, Trent has been in a battle with the FAA for the last three years. Uh, regarding the regulation minimum safe altitudes and a uh, low level inspection pass he had made uh, to inspect possibly landing in a friend's backyard. And Robert is joining us today to give us a summary of that case, where things stand now, and most importantly, to talk to us about the precedent that uh, some of the aspects of this case could have for all pilots in the future. Robert, thanks for joining me today. Good morning, Alyssa, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and your members. Yes, and so uh, can you just give us that high-level summary to get us, you know, all on the same page on Trent's case? Of course. So <clears throat> a couple of years ago, uh, Mr. Palmer conducted uh, what was called an inspection pass on a parcel of property located uh, in the west. Uh, this parcel of property was on the edge of an expanse of desert where the arena or air races are run. But on that expanse, there is a housing community out there. Each of those houses contains parcels of 10 acres each. Uh, Mr. Palmer operates a Kit Fox 5 aircraft, which I'm sure most of your readers understand is a STOL or stall aircraft for short takeoff and landing. Um, it's a modest airplane, fairly low powered, fairly light. Um, his friend uh, allowed him to land on his property on one of those 10 acre parcels. Now the Kit Cox 5 aircraft could take off and land on that parcel properly probably two or three times before it actually reached the end of the property line. Uh, under Nevada law, it's perfectly permissible to land on somebody's property with their permission, which of course Mr. Palmer had. Uh, for its part, the FAA published an off airports guide. Uh, it tells pilots how to conduct an inspection pass to conduct an off airport landing. Uh, Mr. Palmer conducted his inspection pass in accordance with those guidelines published by the FAA. Uh, when he conducted his pass, he wasn't comfortable, and he moved on and landed at a satellite airport, uh, which is exactly what the guide tells a pilot to do under those circumstances. His friend's neighbors apparently did not appreciate the fact that Mr. Palmer was attempting to land at his property and called in the FAA. The FAA, for its part, conducted an investigation. Uh, that investigation led the FAA to believe that Mr. Palmer had violated uh, 14 CFR 91-119. Uh, we're all pilots. We all know what it says, except as necessary for takeoff and landing. You have to maintain certain distances from uh, houses, property, persons, and structures on the ground. Uh, so Mr. Palmer was violated under that provision. Uh, obviously, we disagreed. Uh, we took the case to an administrative law judge. The administrative law judge uh, agreed with the FAA. We appealed that decision to the NTSB. The board upheld the law judge's decision. Uh, and right now, we have a motion for the board to reconsider its decision for a variety of reasons, which we can get into as necessary. Failing that, then we will take the case to the U.S. Court of Appeals. But procedurally, that's where the case stands right now. Okay, okay. And what are what are the most concerning aspects of this with regard to a precedent that could be set for, for pilots in the future? Well, the case raises a number of issues, at least in my mind, but to your specific question of precedence, right now, as I understand the ruling, and you mentioned this earlier, is that there's this mysterious 500 bubble that has to surround every aircraft. And therefore, under no circumstances, unless you are actually engaged in a final approach, can an aircraft operator operate within 500 feet of persons or structures on the ground. Now, why is that concerning? Well, that suggests that, for example, if several aircraft are attempting to land on a gravel bar, which under most circumstances is a fairly tight area, as a result of this ruling, once that first aircraft lands, the second pilot has a choice. He can either land or conduct an inspection pass to satisfy for him or herself whether or not the landing is advisable for that pilot and for that aircraft. But if they conduct that pass and that first aircraft is on the ground and that first person is on the ground, that is a violation. Theor theoretically, uh, if someone were to do an inspection pass on a grass runway at an airport community, for example, Kentmore, Maryland, 
most of the houses that line that grass runway are within 60 feet of the runway itself. So if someone were to come there, unless they're actually landing at that point in time, if they do a pass to make sure there's no deer, obstructions, or anything else on the runway, that is a violation of 91-119 according to this ruling. I could create a number of other examples, but the fact of the matter is the FAA has sent and the board has sent a very confusing message to our community. And the message is, unless you're landing, actually engaged in what otherwise would be called a final approach, and you fly past something, you do a go around, you are in violation. That's a problem. Yeah. That being said, there's more to the case than that, but please. Yeah, no, I was just, uh, you know, as a pilot, even sometimes you, you want to make a couple of passes until you just feel comfortable, period, landing. Um, and so I could see where that could create safety implications as well, you know, in addition to violating uh, that regulation with this reinterpretation and and the reinterpretation is another point I think that you have raised as well as concerning well again the question becomes where is the line between a new rule and reinterpretation and right now at least for this attorney I'm, I'm a little confused on that point point. and if it's a new rule then we have a procedure for that it's called the Administrative Procedures Act it's not a suggestion it's the law and the FAA is required to follow it and Oftentimes they don't, and unfortunately, uh, people get caught up in that confusion. I believe Mr. Palmer is one of them. It's important to point out, too, there's a certain internal inconsistency in this ruling. On the one hand, the FAA publishes a guide on how to conduct an inspection pass. But there's already an aircraft on the ground. So as I said before, the pilot has a choice, and his choice is land or be violated because he's not comfortable with the surface below and he has a passenger on board. If that pilot does not conduct an inspection pass in accordance with the FAA guidelines, and he lands and, God forbid, flips his airplane or injures a passenger, then he's likely going to be violated under 9113A for careless reckless, reckless operation of the aircraft. And why? Because he didn't follow FAA guidance on how to conduct an inspection pass. This decision is putting pilots in an impossible position, and that is my concern. It's not my only concern, but it's a major concern as a result of this decision. Now, what about, uh, um, I had read where the NTSB uh, law judge had, you know, considered the appropriateness of the landing site, and, and yet that isn't anywhere in the minimum safe altitude regulation. How, how are they able to do that? To be fair to the law judge, who was decent and kind and pleasant to deal with, I don't want to suggest in any way, shape, or form otherwise. He was a very professional judge. I just strongly disagree with his ruling. That being said, uh, it is true that there's decisional law that says, look, the landing site has to be appropriate. Otherwise, anything that you do relative to an attempt at landing is unnecessary. For example, you can't run a Lear 45 down a gravel bar and say I was doing an inspection pass. Um, that's inappropriate. The Lear is never going to land there, and what you're doing is just plain silly. So that's, that's decisional law. It's not a rule, but yes, the landing site has to be appropriate. In the course of these proceedings, the FAA withdrew the issue of the appropriateness of a landing site uh, in this particular instance. Therefore, it was not an issue in this case. And indeed, in its complaint against Mr. Palmer, the FAA never alleged that the landing site issue was an issue. They never alleged that the landing site itself was inappropriate. The only thing the complaint said was that on X date, you violated 91-119. That's all it said. It said nothing about landing site, nothing about the inappropriateness of the landing site or otherwise. It didn't mention it at all. But during the course of the proceedings, when that issue came up, the FAA counsel essentially said it's not an issue. But the law judge picked up the issue and he said, well, I think it is an issue. And he proceeded to question my client on the appropriateness and the propriety of this particular landing site. The law judge is supposed to be impartial. He's not supposed to have an interest or a stake in the case. That is the fiction, if you will, that allows people not to claim that there's been a lack of due process. But the minute the judge takes up the position of the FAA, the minute that the judge starts essentially prosecuting the airman, in this case, my client, then he sheds that impartiality and becomes an advocate. And in this case, on behalf of the FAA. 
The FAA did not want to pursue that issue. He did. And the minute he did that, he denied my client due process of law. Again, there's more to the case, but that's a substantial issue in this particular proceeding for the simple reason is that in no small part, his decision to find my client in violation of 91119 was based on the appropriateness of the landing site. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, before we before we go, do you have any other final concerns that, that you really think is um, applicable to the larger pilot community that you want to share? Most people don't go through this process. Most airmen have no idea what happens in an administrative law process, what happens in an enforcement proceeding. Um, it can be scary. It can be very expensive. This was a five-day trial that cost my client thousands and thousands of dollars. People need to know that going in. They need to be prepared for that. They need to understand what their rights are. Get good counsel. No, I'm not celebrating my profession, but folks have no idea what they're up against. When the FAA is coming for you, they're coming. And uh, you better be prepared for it, and you better know what you're up against. And it's a lot. So on that point, I'll defer back to you, but I do appreciate your time. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, to all of our viewers, we will be following Trent's uh, case closely. And um, as, as the appeals and different things continue, we'll be providing reporting on AOPA.org and, and also here on our YouTube channel. And Robert, thank you again so much for your time today. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your interest. Bye. Thank you. Bye.